Welcome to Dental Business Rx. Practice success in 30 minutes or less. Thank you for calling ABC Dental. If I were to ask you why you're doing any sort of marketing in your practice, how would you answer? Well, if you're the average dentist, your answer would be one of two. The first being to get more new patients, and the second being to increase my collections. Now, if I were to take those that answered the question with to increase my collections and ask them, well, how is marketing going to help you increase your collections? Most, at least 80% would say, by getting me more new patients. So my point here is that for most of the dental industry, marketing is a hammer fit for only one nail to get more new patients. And if this is your only take on the subject of marketing, all I can say is you are really missing out. And you might think, well, what am I missing out on? Well, how about a dramatic increase in collections and profit or magnificent gains in patient retention and not to mention a more stably growing dental practice? So beyond new patients, what type of marketing should you be doing in your practice? Well, how about to the patients you already have? you know, your patients of record. Sure, marketing to potential patients in your area is a vital component of any new patient strategy, but it is just as vital and just as important to market to your existing patient base with that same level of intensity and consistency. And that's what I want to talk about in this week's episode. My name is Jeff Bloomberg, and I'm your host. And for this week's topic, we're going to tackle the basics of continuous marketing to your patient base base. We're going to look at the whys, the hows, and get into a couple of specific ideas you can start rolling with right away. And I'm going to give you some ideas. This is by no means a complete list of things you can be doing, uh, or should be doing rather, to market to your base on a regular basis. And I think the best place to start if we're looking at this subject of marketing is with a simple definition of marketing itself. You know, what is marketing supposed to do? Well, in its simplest form, Marketing is basically what a company does to promote or induce the buying or selling of a product or services. You know, a lot of people might think of marketing as, well, this is how I tell people that I'm here and I make myself known and, you know, uh, get people to like my practice. No, the whole purpose of marketing is to buy or sell product or services. If I'm watching a TV commercial, the whole purpose of it is to get me to buy something or a commercial on YouTube, you know, an ad that pops up. The, the whole purpose is to get me to buy or, you know, I'm, obviously I'm not selling anything, but to buy something from that company or for that company to sell me something. All right. And there were a lot of things that would fall under the heading of marketing, which would be more, you know, market research, advertising, uh, parts of the sales process, you know, th things that help salespeople sell, whether that's brochures or, you know, websites, um, education material, et cetera. It makes the sales process easier and gets people to want to participate in the sales process. And you could go further with this. You know, marketing could also include packaging. You know, for instance, when you buy an iPhone or an Apple product, you'll notice it's this, this kind of cool package, right? Well, that's technically marketing. If you buy a luxury car, you know, Lexus, uh, Mercedes, BMW, uh, Audi, et cetera, if you take a look, if you go to one of those dealerships versus, you know, a regular car dealership, the way it looks and there's, you know, a nice coffee machine and things like this and the fact that you're talking to a person in a tie as opposed to in the garage talking to a mechanic, yes, that's customer service and that's service in general, but that's part of marketing. And obviously, your service and your customer service, which is really part of the marketing process to a degree, uh, has to match up to your marketing. You know, it's something that you always want to make sure happens. You don't want to have some fancy marketing for something and then a person walks in and it, it's completely not what they were expecting. You know, if you went into a fancy restaurant, you're how fancy it was and the, the you know, maitre d' was mean and the wait staff were inattentive and, and rude, then it wouldn't match up to the overall marketing to the place, even if the food was good, which is the service itself, right? So you have service, you have customer service. And then you have the marketing in general. Obviously, you want these three things to align, right? But when it comes to marketing, ultimately, what we're trying to do is make people want to buy something and increase the sales process and make it easier. All right. That's, that's basically it. And obviously, with healthcare, it has to be needed or at least wanted in the case of cosmetic type services. 
Now, where dentists get short-sighted with this, which is the industry in general, this isn't like an individual dentist problem. This is sort of the way uh, it's been sort of trained in in the industry. You know, if if you proliferate the industry with a with a big enough idea and enough people think it, then new people coming into the industry think to a degree that this is just the way things are and the way things have always been done. You know, if you want a good example of that, look at you know, PPO participation. If you talk to a doctor 30, 40 years ago about PPOs, they would they would say, why do I want to get you know 60% of what I normally charge? I would never do this. But when 80% of the profession is participating in some way uh, and they've, they've, I don't know, maybe they're not comfortable with it, but they've reconciled themselves with it to a degree, then a newcomer coming into the industry might think that this is just the way things are. And in a similar vein, the idea of patient retention and keeping patients in the practice, uh, which is a super weak spot for a lot of doctors or dentists rather, is something that I think people have some, somewhat become apathetic about, that this is just sort of the way things are. And let me give you an example of this with some basic numbers because you may think, well, I have no patients or you know, patients that want to do any major treatment and so on, right? But let's say you're getting 40 new patients a month, which is not a low number, but that's it's not an uncommon number for us to see. But let's say you've gotten 40 new patients a month for the last five years. This doesn't count. Uh, let's say you were a scratch practice, 40 new patients a month for the last five years. Well, after five years, that's 480 patients a year, you would have 2,400 patients. Okay, now let's say you lost 20% of those patients for whatever reason. You know, they didn't want to be in your practice. They moved, they changed plans, whatever. That still leaves you 1,920 uh, patients, almost 2,000 patients. And that's not including the 40 that you're getting every month. Well, those 2,000 patients, if they were properly activated, educated, and, and kept within the practice with 2,000 patients, if they were doing two recalls a year, that's 4,000 recall visits a year. If you're open 50 weeks a year, which is the average office, that's 80 recall visits a week, okay? That's, that's two 40-hour-a-week hygienists. That doesn't even count soft tissue management or new patients that are being run through hygiene. But I challenge you, you, you will very rarely find a practice with these numbers I just gave you with um, 80 recall patients a week. And part of that is not just an educational failure, it's a marketing failure, Okay, because there's a ton of attention, you know, marketing, especially in dentistry is all about I need more new patients, I need to market. But th there's very little attention paid to marketing, communication and follow up with the patients that you have there, right, or that you've already uh, obtained. And if you want proof of this, just look at your incomplete treatment list. You know, an, an incomplete treatment, you know, obviously I'm not saying that everybody's going to close and do what you say and things along those lines. But if you want to look at the, the point of organizational failure with incomplete treatment, it might be partially a marketing failure. It's definitely a sales failure. It might also be situational. You know, you asked me to buy treatment X and uh, I was in the middle of refinancing my home, which hopefully I'm not doing now with interest rates, but whatever, beside the point. Um, and I tell you, I have to wait. And then, you know, the follow-up from the office isn't very good, so we drop out of communication, and then, you know, I end up on your incomplete treatment list for the next two years, right? It doesn't hurt, so I'm not you know, running to the phone to call you, all right? Well, so initially, that was a, a it was more situational. You could say it was a sales failure. It was a follow-up failure. But the, the if I'm on that incomplete treatment list now for two years, that really becomes a marketing failure at that point, potentially, at least in my mind. If I was being regularly communicated to, and I was receiving... Uh, whether it was phone calls, marketing pieces, something to keep me associated with and connected to the practice, most likely I'd at least show up for something, even if it was to get my teeth cleaned or to get them bleached and then I'd be in the practice and you'd go, hey, Jeff, you know, we never got that treatment done. You have another sales opportunity at that point. So we have, and, and I'm going to get into more the marketing aspects of it, but what kind of supports the marketing or helps the marketing carry the load is the follow-up that has from your pre that, that happens from your practice. And most offices aren't built for this follow-up. They're built specifically just to handle the patients that are already coming in or with the acquisition of new patients. And look, I've said this before, but I'll say it again. Uh, and because, and I keep saying it until people actually really listen and I see more people adopt this stance, but there's huge amounts of effort, not just marketing dollar spend or anything along those lines, but there's huge amounts of effort in the acquisition created or, or expended in the acquisition of new patients. You know, we've, we've gone over these numbers before where the average patient coming off a postcard is going to cost you 350 bucks or Google pay-per-click when it's done in a very average mediocre way is going to cost you $422 per new patient. So there's a lot of effort put there. There's a lot of uh, uh, resources expended there. But then once you've actually obtained that patient, whether they bought or not, so let's say they bought 
all of what you presented that they needed, they needed treatment, or they bought part of it, they're only doing what insurance covers now, or they didn't buy it all. Okay, either way. Uh, there's a couple things that you know is, you know, a person has a mouth and they have teeth, right? So if a person does, whether you've done all their treatment now, if they're going to stay a lifelong patient, they're going to need more treatment. But the only way that you're going to get a chance to do that treatment, even if they have great oral hygiene and, or, and, and great home care, there's most likely as they age, there's going to be wear and things along those lines. In order for you to have a shot at doing that treatment, they have to stay in the practice. Otherwise, that's never going to happen. And that's where there's very little effort, resources, or marketing dollars expended. There's little to none. I mean, think about it for a second. So you're spending, uh, let's say we get a patient, it's a, a 52-year-old person, okay? And they need uh, a considerable amount of restorative work. So you brought them in, it cost you $350 to get them as a patient via a postcard. And they come into the practice and you have a great customer experience. So that's good. Your office is clean and it looks nice. Uh, that's also good. This is all part of the marketing process. And your sales process isn't bad. Let's say you close them on their complete treatment plan. And you schedule them for uh, their next recall appointment, which most likely will be three months from now. But let's say it's six months from now, just for argument's sake. Six months go by. And, you know, if you really think about it, very few people know what they're going to be doing at two o'clock on a Wednesday, six months from now. Uh, nobody does. Okay. But they can at least um, have an idea that that's when they're going to come and make it work. And in a lot of cases, patients will keep those appointments, but they don't know for sure. So they schedule. And then something comes up. They have to leave town. They had a family emergency. They got busy. They didn't realize there was a big office uh, retreat that week or something along these lines. So they schedule that time with you, and now they can't make it. So they call the office, and they say, hey, you know, I'm not going to be able to make this appointment. So obviously, ideally, you want your office to reschedule them. Well, let's say they're really busy. They have to go. They have another call, so they don't reschedule right now. All right. So now you put them on a list to follow up. And this is where offices are not built for this process, okay? Everybody in your office, whether they have assigned division of labor, you have division of labor and people have assigned duties, you know, schedule, finance, et cetera, or if they're just all the front desk, right? Everybody in your office has plenty of work to do with whatever they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Unless you have somebody specifically dedicated to filling a hygiene schedule or following up on patients who need to be brought back in on the hygiene schedule, especially if there's a considerable number of those, let's say you have 2,000, 3,000 inactive patients, those people aren't getting enough follow-up to keep them active in the practice. So what ends up happening is that patient came in, they missed that six-month recall, uh, Maybe somebody called him back the week after, you know, hey, we have a last minute opening. Do you want to take it? Uh, okay, can we schedule you? Sorry, I'm busy right now. And then maybe they don't get another phone call for three to six months. Maybe your office is slow, so you decide to do some chart audits, right? It, during chart audits, I would get called early because my last name starts with a B. If my last name started with a, I don't know, a, a Y, uh, unless you did it backwards, which some offices do. I'll never get a phone call. But the amount of effort and time and work and, and sweat that's put into keeping patients is minimal, if not at all. I might get a phone call every three, six months, if, if at all. Maybe I get an email. Maybe I get a letter. But you look at the, the, the intensity with which we approach getting a new patient in. We have to get them in in 24 to 48 hours. New patients are important, et cetera. But what about the folks you already had? You see, so there's little to no effort, little to no expense. There's little to no marketing going on. Let's say since the last time I was in your practice, you've added three new services. You now do implants. You place them now. You don't just restore them. Uh, you do clear aligners. Maybe you didn't do them before. Or you have a new type that you're doing that you really like. And you do sleep apnea treatment. And maybe I need one or two of these or this patient does. Well, nobody's telling patients that you do it. Because again, in a lot of cases, when a, a new service is added in a practice, most of the marketing materials I've seen is from the company who does or teaches that service. There's very little generated or done from the doctor themselves, and there might be a banner or a sign here or there, but the outreach to the patients of record is minimal, if not at all, okay? So, and this is why, you know, for that matter, you may be involved in one of these, uh, what do you call them? They're like a patient discount plan, you know, where you, it's, the idea is to create subscription-based revenue with your patient base, you know, so I pay $110 a month and my family gets free cleanings and discount, a 10% discount on your services. It's sort of like your own sort of PPO, but the, the rates aren't horrid, right? Uh, and it creates recurrent revenue for you every month. And there are companies that do this and they have HIPAA compliant servers. The biggest problem with these companies is none of the patients buy the plan. Why? Because nobody's marketing it and selling it to the patients in the practice, okay? You're depending on your front desk who's already overloaded and overwhelmed and having to deal with 10 other things. And this is just another nice thing to do, 
Okay, it's not something that they have to do. They know they have to fill that opening on the hygiene schedule tomorrow at 11. But if they don't sell the next three patients that come in to get on your discount plan, they're not going to get in trouble. But if there's you know two hygiene openings tomorrow, they're, they're in trouble. So this is where the follow-up is usually very weak in the practice and the amount of marketing and outreach, especially for when you add new services or to retain patients, is minimal or not done at all. So ultimately, what you're looking to do with your marketing when you're marketing to your patient base is really two things. It's, it's two, but the second one has a couple subheads, so bear with me. First thing is you're trying to keep your patient base active and retained. You're trying to keep those patients in the practice. And obviously, I could go on with, okay, they're going to need more treatment, et cetera. Look, let's look at this from just a straight purpose perspective. If a patient stays loyal in your practice and shows up regularly, you're going to catch problems before they become bigger. You're going to uh, be able to stay on top of their oral health and oral health contributes to quality of life and systemic health. So if a patient is a regular good patient in your practice who shows up regularly, they're going to be healthier. Potentially, they're going to live longer and potentially they're going to have a better quality of life. Now, sure, you'll have more revenue from that patient in your practice. That is a secondary benefit. And then the one thing you got to think about is they know people and they'll refer more patients to your practice. You will have more new patient referrals. So number one, with our marketing, we're trying to keep our patient base active. Number two, with our marketing, we're trying to keep all of our patient base aware of all the things we can do in this practice. Okay. Some of the health type issues, you know, when it comes to things like implants or different restorative techniques that you're learning. And some of these are going to be cosmetic issues or cosmetic, cosmetic treatments, you know, veneers and clear aligners or anything you can do to improve someone's appearance. Because, yeah, maybe it's not a health issue. You know, you can't sit there for, for I don't know, a half hour and tell me I have to fix that diastema in the front of my teeth, which I don't have. But let's say I did. If there's no health ramifications of it, it's, you know, that's an optional thing. But maybe I hate it and I want to fix it. So, if I'm not aware that you can fix it, I'm. I, I, I trust me, folks. I've seen patients go to other practices for services. I've had new clients tell me that they've had a patient show up in either wearing, you know, Clear Correct or Invisalign or something like this. When they they actually did do those services in their practice, but the patient didn't know, so they went to another practice, got a Clear Aligner done, and came back to their dentist. No, oh, I thought you didn't do this. Okay, you would be shocked at how many things your patients don't know. That you do. And you would think, well, of course, they'll just ask. Yes, some will, but not everybody will. So we've got these two things, right? We would want keep our patients active and then keep our patients aware of all the services that we can potentially do. Ideally, we'd even want to break this down further. I'm not telling you you need to do this now, but I can tell you that if I were doing this, this is what I would do. I would have some way of cataloging patients that were candidates for implants, candidates for some type of clear aligner, candidates for, you know, for various types of cosmetic work, candidates for any other services that I either do or might be adding so that I could, you know, maybe even customize my marketing to them and send them things to keep them aware of that I can do these things to help them. So let's just say you're starting on this journey. You want to make an earnest effort to market to your patient base. What are a few things that you could do? I mean, what are the basics? Obviously, some of the basics are you need to offer good customer service. You need to have your office have a nice appearance. And that doesn't mean you have to go off and buy, you know, a marble countertop from Italy or something that that cost you eleven thousand dollars. A good paint job and it being clean is a good place to start. Okay, as you make more money, you can always make things you know, a, a bit more fancy, but you have to have good customer services. Patients, patient need to feel like they're being taken care of and have individual address. And the place has to have a good appearance. That, that's a basic for any kind of marketing. Otherwise you get this big letdown, right? Okay. And obviously your dental services have to be good and done in a timely fashion. These are all no brainers. So let's talk about retention for a second. So beyond the usual activity that you might be doing for retention, meaning I came in, you scheduled me for my next recall. This is what's normally done. And I get some type of a text or a postcard or a reminder when my appointment is due. I would do a few other things on top of that, especially for patients that have missed. You know, when I've hit that point where I've missed my hygiene appointment, first off, if I'm still within that six month window or three month window that I was supposed to be seen, that should take a different level of priority meaning it's part of the scheduler's job or the hygiene coordinator's job to chase me to get me scheduled because I'm still in that window where I'm not overdue, okay? That isn't somebody that can just float off and become part of your your inactive patient list. That person needs to be aggressively pursued. You know, you know what I mean by aggressively, like called routinely until they are scheduled, okay? 
But then now you got the patients who are truly overdue. Well, these people should be on a regular schedule of communication. You know, we have something called the reactivation program. We're in the process of updating it, but I'll put the current version um, for download on the uh uh, episode webpage, and then you can get a notification if you want from when the next one is, is ready. But we have something called the reactivation program, which gives you a series of steps to stay in communication with your patient base and keep them active. You can download it if you want by checking it out on the uh, episode webpage. And that has some of the letters and suggestions that we have. But I would have a regular um, outreach with emails, letters, calls. There's there's bulk texts that you can do to patients that are overdue. And in some cases, you might want to mix these up. We have a client uh, that's using a bulk, uh, bulk texting service, which is very cool. If you have questions about it, you can email me. But uh, what they did is they go after the patients that are overdue. You know, first, hey, come in for a cleaning. Um, you know, it's been a while since we've seen you, et cetera. And then they kind of mixed it up one month where they told them, you know, come in for a consultation. I think they were offering these patients, since they were patients of record, a free consultation. And they actually got a lot of traction from that. A lot of patients came back um, that they hadn't seen in a while because, you know, they were missing a tooth, that they uh, were having trouble with this or trouble with that. And it was very from – from a return on investment perspective, it was huge um, getting these patients back. And that's something to think about. If you have a patient has, that, is, that saw you three, four years ago and they have a lot of outstanding treatment versus a patient that you're just meeting off the street for the first time – that patient from three or four years ago at least knows you. You're going to have a much easier time closing that patient for the treatment that they need. There's some degree of relationship. So there has to be continuous communication, bulk text, emails, uh, whatever letters, snail mail still works. You know, you might grab a few charts of people that are overdue and send them some letters. Hey, Bill, you know, last time we saw you was in uh, 2019. How are you doing? You know, please give us a call and come in for a cleaning. Any type of regular, consistent communication there is extremely important. I would also have promotion around the office about this. You may have a mission statement. That's something you want to go over the, with every new patient when you see them. And part of that mission statement is probably about helping them maintain their oral health and keeping their teeth for their lifetime, right? The idea being that if they see you regularly in hygiene, you have an opportunity to do that. So I would have signs up, you know, about how important it is to make sure they don't miss their checkup appointment and what, you know, why it's important. Uh, various little, they don't even have to be big signs. It can be little signs in the hygiene area. That should be part of any patient education process, the importance of keeping that hygiene appointment because, you know, what if they schedule and then something happens and they can't make it? Well, it's been sort of planted in their head that, wow, you know, I can't miss this appointment. This is extremely important. It should be multiple vectors. Um, it should be something meaning coming from mail, email, fax, uh, as well as verbal within the practice, as well as phone follow up. And it should be consistent. The, the key is, you know, it's consistent, it's regular, and that's how you're going to affect your recall, right? To keep your recall active. Now, patient marketing would also extend as far as for, for retention. Uh, to anything you send out on a routine basis, you know, hey, it's back to school, use it or lose it, uh, use it or lose it. Sorry, I had trouble saying that. Insurance letters, things along those lines, those can go out in, you know, October. They could also go out again in January, not use it or lose it, but hey, it's renewed, come on in now, right? Um, and you go, okay, well, I don't want to participate in insurance or I hate insurance, fine, but it's just another reason to come in. I'm not saying, if you don't participate or if you don't have insurance or you don't accept assignment to start doing that, I'm saying it's it's another reason to show up. So you can be inviting them in for consults, back for their hygiene appointments, as well as any type of seasonal mailing uh, that you're sending out from the practice. And I wouldn't just do email. I would do email and I would do snail mail. Okay. I know snail mail is more expensive, but email, uh, go into your inbox in your, your personal email and you'll see why you don't want to just do email. Okay. And then the last thing is I would have some type of a practice newsletter. Now the newsletter is going to serve two purposes. It's going to help you with retention as well as marketing other services, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute when I get into the next aspect of marketing. So we've got retention as our first objective. The other is to keep patients aware of all of the services that we have going in the practice, whether it's implants or FMR, all on fours, et cetera. So in that case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to want posters and posters and signage within the practice, okay? What I also might want is most people have some form of a television in their waiting area, uh, please don't play the news out there. I, you know, what, what's better than the news is maybe Animal Planet or HGTV. I wouldn't even play that. What I would actually play instead, I've seen a few people do this. They have on a loop patient testimonials and educational videos from the doctor, especially from the doctor who owns the practice. So you might have the doctor talking about what an all on X or all on four, six, whatever you call it. Treatment plan is, you know, this is how it works and this is what we do. Then you might have one or two patients with before or afters and you need releases for this stuff. I can I can put a sample HIPAA release 
on the episode webpage. By no means is it something you can just use straight. You would want this checked by your attorney, but it's not very difficult. But you could have almost a video loop going where here's uh, some education from the doctor, then a bunch of testimonial videos, then another educational video from the doctor and more testimonial videos. And you could have it on a one or two hour loop and it's just, you know, rolling through for patients who are sitting in the waiting area. And you can always update it over time. You can also repurpose those videos, whether you're doing marketing on TikTok or YouTube or Facebook or Instagram, et cetera. They have a use everywhere, okay? But that is a form of marketing. So I'm sitting in reception, and this can be even about silly things, right? You know, about veneers, right? Maybe I don't think I need veneers, and but I would look a lot better with them. And I'm watching your video, and there you are. You're talking about what veneers are and how they work. And, oh, I didn't know that's what they were. And then here's a couple patients, and I see the before and after, and I go, wow, those people look dynamite. And then I come back from my cleaning, and I'm asking your hygienist now, you know, hey, what, what about those veneers things? Can I talk to the doctor about that? How much do those cost? This is what you want your marketing to do with your patients of record. So we want videos, posters, signs, etc. There should be emails letters, etc., And then we have our newsletter, right? So what should our practice newsletter look like? Well, first off, I'm going to take an unpopular view on this. I don't like canned newsletters, something that you buy from a company that looks like it's, you know, you didn't make it. As a matter of fact, if I were to get, I want you to think with this for a second, think with a big 11 by 17 piece of paper. It's basically the, twice the size of an eight and a half, 11 uh, size piece of paper. If you open it up, you fold it down two times, it becomes a mailer. That could be, your newsletter could be that simple to start. And you can, of course, do an email version as well, but I would definitely do snail and email here. The reason I say snail mail is forwarding orders from the post office expire after six months. So if you don't mail to people routinely, um, you're going to lose addresses. The forwarding orders expire. Now, sure, you can go on Google and get that new address, but why would you want to waste time doing that? Okay, you'd be better off getting the new address for the person because you mailed to them within that time period, as well as some people just don't read all this stuff in their email. And now with things like uh, Gmail's partitioning of different types of emails, you know, with promotions or social media and your normal inbox, there's a good chance if you send out any type of a bulk email, your patients aren't even going to see it. So you want to have both of those things going. And yes, it costs a couple dollars, but this is the whole point, folks. You should be spending some dollars on mailing to your patients. So I would be more apt if I got a newsletter, and maybe it wasn't as fancy as one of these canned newsletters, but it was obvious that your office made this. I'm probably going to read it. Okay. That's just me. You could survey people and see what they think, but I get lots of slick and pretty magazine type things in my mailbox. But if I got something from, and I've, I've gotten these before, I get it from a group that maybe I know about, or I've been to one of their you know meetings or their place or their business, and I get something that was obviously made by that business, I read that because it's interesting. I know the people that are appearing in this newsletter. So what would you want in your newsletter? I'm going to give you a basic outline. First, you're going to want some kind of an article that's helpful and educational. Not too long. We're not writing a white paper here. It could be something about gum disease and overall health. It could be, uh, you know, home care instructions. It could be, you know, how, when to start brushing your kid's teeth. It could be anything, okay? Uh, I would then, some people go, should I have a recipe? I don't know. Up to you. I, I probably wouldn't, but that's up to you, okay? That's just me. But some people do and they're happy with it. I don't think it's going to make or break your newsletter. I would have team news. You know, Susie just had a baby. Uh, we just hired a new hygienist, Bill. Uh, these are the things you want. Here's our new associate doctor. You should come meet uh, her or him. You, you, these are the type of things you want in there. The team and office news. What's going on in the practice, right? You might want to also add if you're doing any uh, different services. And this is always a tricky one. If you didn't place implants before and then you went to a course and you learned how and you come back and you have some patient who's the you know average, maybe a little bit uptight, uh, you know, doesn't move very fast and you come back, let's say his name's Bill. You go, hey, Bill, I just learned how to place implants and you're missing a tooth. I would like to do an implant on you. Bill's probably going to say, why don't you do a few for a while and then give me a call? Like that's a bit overwhelming for Bill. It's a bit too much, right? Why don't you get good at these first, doctor? That's a bit, bit much for me. So on the one hand, I'm all for promoting new services, but if there's a way to do it without stressing the newness to you, I think that's ideal. Okay. So, you know, did you know we, you know, we do implants would be better than I just learned how to place implants. Okay. That's my two cents, but uh, up to you.
right? So you would have that in any office news. You know, did you know we do blah? Um, you know, here's our new uh, chair that we added. Um, here's, uh, you know, our parking lot just got redone, whatever. Any type of office news that makes the patients feel like they're part of the conversation, I would put in this newsletter. So we have an article, team news, office news. Then I would highlight specific services and successes from those services. Again, you'll need HIPAA releases, obviously. But if we're highlighting a service like uh, implants or we're highlighting a service like FMR, all on X or something like this, you might have a little bit about it that's very easy to understand, okay? And you might want to call it a permanent implant denture, something people are going to understand. And then you have pictures. You'd want before and afters. You'd want to uh, give a brief explanation of the process and how cool it is and how easy it is. And if they have questions about it for them or any of their friends or family to give you a call. Okay, you would want that in your newsletter. Then ideally, your patient newsletter would have some form of an offer in it. Now, you might go, well, Jeff, why would I put an offer in something for people that are already patients? Well, again, remember, every one of your your patients in your charts are getting this newsletter, at least one per household. You know, a three-year-old patient doesn't need to get this. But everybody, every household's getting this newsletter. So uh, not everybody is scheduled. So if you had, I wouldn't give away free cleanings because that might get a little weird as a pay. Hey, I got your newsletter. It says you're doing cleanings for free. I probably wouldn't do that. But I would offer a free consultation, you know, uh, have, a, have a dental problem or question, come in for a free consultation. But I would make the offer differ in every newsletter. It might be a discounted bleaching. It might be some type of a something, something you can offer that might induce a patient to come in or to come back, but that at the same time doesn't cheapen or invalidate the services you are already doing. So I wouldn't offer a discounted cleaning in my patient newsletter, or you're going to have patients who are already coming in who want a discounted cleaning. Well, you do that on your new patient promo is one thing, but I wouldn't do it in this. And your newsletter should go out every quarter at least. You can do it more frequently if you want, up to you, right? So if we're, get, again, looking at services, we're looking at posters, educational material in the practice, we're looking at videos, we're looking at regular emails, letters, texts, etc. cetera. If uh, maybe I'm reaching out to specific patients who have that particular problem, saying the doctor would like to see them for some form of a consultation, if I'm sending them a letter about it, I would ideally like to have some type of promotional material that I can stuff in the envelope with the letter that pertains to that particular service. Okay. Obviously, I'm going to want all this stuff on my website as well, as well as all the videos, because a patient can just go there, especially if I send them an email with a link. And then I'm going to want to have a newsletter going out once a quarter. Okay. And all of this should be on some type of a marketing calendar, and it all has to be somebody's responsibility. Ideally, whoever's handling your new patient marketing should take over uh, this type of marketing as well. Okay. And if it's continuous, it will increase the flow and stabilize retention, and it will also increase and stabilize your income. And I, you know, like I said, the most important thing about this is with more active patients who are showing up on a regular basis, you're going to have a healthier patient base. And again, you're going to get a ton more referrals because you have more active patients. So I guess the message of all of this, sure, you need more new patients. You always do. And don't in any way change your attitude towards that. Okay. If anything, heighten your attitude towards getting more new patients, but don't forget about the people that you already have. They're, they're part of what makes your practice what it is, and they deserve some attention too, okay? So start marketing to your patient base. Anyway, folks, I hope this helps. That's all I have for you this week. I have those downloads on the episode webpage for the reactivation program, as well as the sample, sample, HIPAA release. Have your lawyer check it. If you have any questions about anything I went over in this episode, please email me at jeffb at mgeonline.com. And uh, if you have any questions about MGE, you can find us online at mgeonline.com or call us at 800-640-1140. Folks, have a great week, and I'll see you at the next episode.